So, um, so we're waiting for more folks to come on. I think we'll get started uh, in the formal presentation in a couple of minutes while we wait for more folks to sign up. If you're um, if you're paying attention to Long Live the King's work and uh, you visit our website or you get our mailings, you probably saw our new uh, 2025 strategic roadmap. We're really excited about that. Talks about what Long Live the King's is going to be doing over the next five years to recover wild salmon and steelhead and support sustainable fishing. And we also just uh, produced our 2020 annual report that highlights a few of the things that we did this year. Um, thanks to all of our donors uh, from last year. And um, so check those out on our website at lltk.org. So um, I think maybe, I think maybe we can go ahead and get started. So um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm Jacques White. I'm the executive director of Long Live the Kings. Very happy to be you be here. You can see uh, Fifth Avenue downtown in Seattle live behind me. I'm at our office in the Skinner Building. Um, and with me, I have Sarah Harvey, who is the culinary operations and saloon manager for Hama Hama Oysters. Hi, Sarah. You want to say hi? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for coming out today. Yeah, we're so glad to have her here. She's going to be showing you how to prepare a potential holiday salmon meal. She's got a great presentation, looking forward to that. And also we have uh, Amy Simpson with us, who's the Director of Advocacy and uh, Product Sustainability at PCC Community Markets. And Amy's also, uh, as of last week, one of the newest board members of Long Live the King. So welcome, Amy. Thank you so hey, much. Chef. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Amy's going to be telling us about um, the PCC's program to sustainably procure and offer salmon and other seafood to their, their uh, customers. So we're really excited to have these two speakers here. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, and from Long with the Kings, we want to wish you uh, a happy and safe holiday season. Uh, I know it's been one heck of a crazy year. And uh, we would love to be doing this presentation to you live. Uh, maybe in a kitchen where we could try the salmon afterwards, but you'll just have to imagine how great it tastes and try to fix, replicate this at home. Um, uh, I know food and, uh, is a, a great thing that we all like to, to have to, to, to celebrate. It's you know, what we always gather around. Uh, and salmon is one of those dishes that uh, during the holiday season, a lot of people like to prepare salmon along with their roast beef or turkey or ham or whatever else they they like, and cookies, of course. Um, but we thought it'd be really fun to uh, have Sarah come on here and do a presentation for us on how to prepare a sustainably caught or procured salmon dinner. Um, just a little bit before we get started with that, um, uh, uh, Long with the Kings has been working with um, the Hama Hama Oyster uh, Company for, for many years. In fact, the Robbins family has homesteaded the lower portion of the Hama Hama River. And for at least the last 20 years, Long Live the Kings has had the good fortune to work with them on recovering uh, uh, wild summer chum populations, uh, trying to reestablish uh, a wild Chinook population there and recovering uh, wild steelhead. So it's been a great partnership. Um, whenever we have an event out at Lilywap, we try to bring folks over to the uh, Hama Hama Oyster Saloon to, to try some of their great fare that I know um, they would be happy to offer you if you could get out there. Uh, and before I hand this over to um, Sarah, I, I probably should do a little bookkeeping here. So if you look on the screen, we, we, have, uh, we encourage you to ask questions. We're gonna have a question and answer period at the end. Um, there's a, at the bottom of the screen, there's a question and answer box and you can put your questions in there. If you wanna um, send it anonymously, you don't want it to be attributed to your name, you can click that. Uh, and I, I encourage you to look at other folks' uh, questions and your own questions and upvote them by hitting the upvote button. Um, and that we will uh, address the questions based on which questions get the greatest number of upvotes. So please pay attention to that. Okay, without further ado, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah and you can run us through how to prepare a salmon. Oh, I guess one more thing. So what she's preparing is actually a trout and it's a sustainably reared pond trout, uh, but the recipe that she's using could very equal, uh, just as well apply to salmon, maybe even better. Okay, so Sarah, take it away. 
Awesome. Yeah, so we, um, here at the saloon, we actually, we use a lot of Chinook that we source through our local tribal fishermen. And I had the super good fortune the other day of Rick Endicott, who runs the hatchery down here um, and works with Long Live the Kings, offered to bring a couple of his steelhead, which start as wild spawn and are, are grown in a hatchery environment to help increase the, the natural spawn that's available here in the Hood Canal that's, that's suffered over the years. So super, super cool fish to work with if you're gonna, if you are gonna use farmed fish, um, the wild spawn is, is delightful. We, so we took the fish and we, um, you know, we're thinking about holidays and we're thinking about, you know, there's a pandemic going and how are most people eating? And it's, it's probably about once, once a month at the grocery store, you're digging out of the garden. We planted a garden here at the beginning of our, at the beginning of our pandemic adventure. And so as we're hitting the end of fall, the garden has been stripped. We're thinking about things that could work well for an easy, accessible, anybody can make it kind of holiday dinner. So, you know, cedar is something that's readily available here. We do own a timber farm. Um, and I would say if you don't have cedar available, use a cookie sheet. It's totally, you know, this is a, this is a set of methodologies that should work kind of for everybody, regardless of what you have. Salmonoids are one of my favorite kind of fish to cook. They have a beautiful, beautiful fat and flavor content. They also grow in my backyard. I can walk out to my beach and go, you know, fish salmon, harvest oysters. So we're trying to stick with local things here. We harvested these blackberry, we foraged these blackberries earlier in the summer and we threw them in our freezer. The greens and the potatoes are kind of what's left in the garden at this point. So we went out there last, last week in the rain and we're pulling down some kale and digging out the last few potatoes for the year. And that's kind of where the, the core of this dish came from was what's here, what's free, what's available. Um, you know, and I would encourage you to, to do the same kind of cooking at home right now. You know, if you have roast vegetables, if you have tubers or you have carrots or you have fennel or kind of anything in the drawer, you can roast the same way this, this smashed taters recipe works for anything that's going to go in the oven with fat and salt. The greens could be kale, they could be chard, they could be spinach, they could be broccoli if you really wanted. Um, you know, and then the mustarda as well, it's it's a big fancy way to say we've got some fruit and some vinegar and some sugar and it's going to go really, really well with a nice fatty option. So that's kind of my introduction to this, uh, to this method and I think we're ready for the next slide, Jack. Perfect. Yeah, so here's, here's the fish that we got from Rick um, in your top right corner. Here's the way we received them. They were super, super fresh when I got them. One thing you're going to want to look for when you are sourcing salmon, if it's whole fish, is you want to make sure that it's been cleaned well that the eyes are glossy if they're there and the scales are tight. And I'll be honest, I've been purchasing fish for 15 years. I don't really fish them a lot. So I lean on the expertise of my fishmongers, of the people behind the counter when I go to PCC or Met Market, you know, any of those stores. I look for reliable sourcing. I go to restaurants that, that advertise that they source sustainable fish or I don't purchase fish from them. You know, we, we have small choices that we can make at every point in our economic day that are gonna support sustainability and they're gonna support local restaurants and local fish people. So if you're not sure where to go, you don't have to be brilliant. You just need to ask brilliant questions, which are, hey, is this fish sustainable? Is this raised in a way that's gonna make my family and myself feel good about our dinner? Um, so here on the top right, you can see nice cold fish. Um, we butchered that super fresh. And I've also included a picture down on the bottom right, kind of a, what that fish should look like if you're, if you're fishing it yourself or if you're buying a whole intact fish from your monger, you know, the inside, it's not, not soaked with blood. Everything's nice and firm. The fish has been kept super cold. The muscle is, is, is kind of got a springiness to it when you touch. And most importantly, it does not smell fishy. It smells fresh. So when you're sourcing fish, that is not a smell that you're looking for. Um, just to be super clear, I think we should all know that by now, but just in case. Um, and then on the left, I also included a picture of some of the other cool parts that come with fish if you are fishing them yourself or buying them intact. This steelhead had roe inside, which is awesome. We're gonna use that in an oyster special this weekend at the saloon, putting a little bit of this, the steelhead roe on top of some raw oysters. The liver is also super tasty. Liver is a great way to get extra iron in your diet, especially in the winter. And then the little wings over there on the corner that you can see, you can either take the collar off right behind the wings all the way down, or you can just trim those little guys. And they're fun to throw into some broth, or you can just sear them up in a pan. Um, my dog really likes them too, as long as they're you know caught fresh, not, not rotten salmon on the corner. Um, so yeah, so here's just kind of a quick picture. If you're gonna be butchering salmon, I would highly recommend that you watch a YouTube video if you're gonna do it, do not rely on these slides. Um, but yeah, I think we're ready for the next slide. And then here's the salmon post butcher. 
So we took the, we took all the little bits off and then we took a big, big knife that you saw in one of those pictures and we just kind of sliced right along the sand, the, the spine of this fish. We took the fillets off. We made sure there was no bloodline left. Um, I took a pin boner, so a little pair of tweezers and we just removed those little fish bones all the way down. Totally not necessary, but if you're serving it to somebody that is young or maybe is not ready to, to work around fish bones, you know, maybe they've got some mobility issues. I'd, I'd highly recommend everybody pin bone their fish. It's, we've, it's 2020, you deserve this. You deserve fish without bones. <laughs> um, so don't worry about scaling it though. We're gonna cook it in the skin. We're gonna let all of that natural fat underneath the skin kind of bubble up and poach inside that salmon as we're going. A um, little bit of salt right on top. Fish is salty, it grows in a brackish environment. It tends to finish in freshwater though, going up the streams. So by the time salmon are hitting this kind of, this fall season, salmon season, the, the water is starting to get a little bit cleaner. So I like to add salt. Um, if you are salt sensitive at all though, please don't feel like you need to salt your seafood. Um, I've worked in restaurants for 20 years and I have a weird salt relationship. So a little bit of salt right on top. If you're gonna salt, salt right before you cook it though, really important because the salt pulls out extra moisture of anything it cooks. Maybe you've salted broccoli and realized that it's kind of wet when it goes in the oven 20 minutes later. Salt at the last moment or salt early in the cooking process. So it has a chance to get all the way into the flesh. The last thing you want at holiday dinner is to taste that salt right on the tip of your tongue. All right, next, next slide. So we've got the salmon, it's on the cedar board, we're ready to go. What are the garnishes? Um, and this was something that I, I kind of pitched to my boss and they were like, this is, sounds a little fancy, but I think, it's a, I think it's an amazing dish that everybody should, should be really comfortable making. Mustarda is kind of like a chutney with a sugar vinegar component. You can make it with anything in your fridge, a can of pears, a, a bruised apple, some berries in your freezer. Um, it's something that I think everybody should have in their basic pandemic cooking repertoire. It's gonna make your, your, your food taste just a lot tastier. A chunk of cheese is gonna taste better. So if we move to the next slide, we'll kind of break it down into the ingredients here. So it's, we've got some fresh fruit, some shallots, some fresh herbs from our garden. That was the same herbs, those, that time right there is what I threw underneath the fish on top of that cedar board. Totally unnecessary, but it adds a layer of flavor. The, the core of cooking in restaurants is how many layers of flavor can you get in there? We're not doing anything magic. We're just salting at the beginning. We're adding time at every layer. Um, you know, and so as we move through the, the processes, think about it at every stage. If you were gonna stop cooking right here, does this taste good? And if not, maybe it should taste good, even if you're gonna take it further down the road. So that way you're not throwing a bunch of salt or a bunch of herbs in right at the end and you have that, that kind of like hot pop of, of unseasoned food with salt on top of it. Um, here's a little demo of how to mince some shallots too, another kind of a basic cooking deep dive for anybody who is looking at this just going, oh my God, what are you talking about right now? Um, you know, you can chop it up with your knife a million times. You can get really nerdy on it and go in vertically and then horizontally with a million cuts. Either way, we wanna chop up some shallots or chop up some red onion or chop up some sweet onion and throw it in there with the fruit, throw it in there with the mustard, the vinegar, the sugar, and cook it until you've got something really nice. If it's too juicy, drain some liquid off. Throw that on your oysters as a mignonette later. But um, just, you know, the, the core of this is just don't take it too seriously. Buy fresh fish, dig around in your fridge. We got this. All right, next slide. And then here we go, here's, here's halfway through. So if you have the recipe in front of you, um, you know, we've got our mustard seeds in with the vinegar and the wine and the sugar. Sugar technically counts as a liquid if you're baking cookies or making anything, just a fun note in there. But we've got our mustard seeds poaching in those liquids. They're gonna plump up. And then if you shift over to the right, the finished product, you can see these blackberries that have been in my freezer for six months um, with some mustard seeds, fresh thyme out of the garden, a little bit of red wine that was left open from a bottle last night, some sugar. And we got something kind of magical. I think most of us probably have mustard in our fridge at this point. Um, all right, yeah, so let's, let's move on. That was definitely the hard work of the thing. If you've reached this point, pour yourself a glass of wine. You deserve it. Now it's just potatoes and greens. All right, greens. Braised greens for everybody. You can go hard French on this one where it hurts your caloric intake, or you can go super, super healthy like you're gonna go hiking at four in the morning. Either way, greens, onions, garlic, some kind of acid, a little bit of fat, and some salt in the pan. That's it. Um, I like apple cider vinegar and chicken broth. You're more than welcome to use water, lemon juice, and olive oil if that's more what kind of fits your life. But either way, greens, garlic, salt, vinegar. Simple. 
This would work with kale, spinach, Swiss chard. Um, I wouldn't try it with romaine. You can grill that. And then potatoes. Uh, you could do this with potatoes. You could do it with parsnips, sweet potatoes, carrots, um, pretty anything that you could kind of smash once it's cooked would work really well here. So we're going to cook our potatoes whole. We're going to add thyme, bay leaf, enough salt to make the water taste like the ocean. This is that salting at the beginning point that I was mentioning earlier. And I'd recommend it as a good cooking step for pasta, for potatoes, for grains, anything that's going to be cooked in liquid and drained out, cook it so the water tastes like the ocean. And then you're not going to need to add a bunch of salt to it later down the step. So whole potatoes, thyme, salt, cold water. The reason we like to use cold water is hot water can sometimes pull minerals and chemical deposits out of the, the pipes, if, especially if you live in a city. So highly recommend everybody start with nice cold water out of the tap when they're cooking anything. All right, next one. And then once the potatoes are cooked, we're just going to smash them. This is a great task for uh, Friday night if it's been a hard one at the work from home office or if you have kids that are interested in helping with dinner but you don't wanna involve them with the hot oil parts. Um, you know, some nice cooked potatoes, just a little bit of a smash. We call it the big clap here at work. Um, but you're just gonna smash them, not all the way down. On the right, you can see kind of, we're looking for these little discs that have the inside piece exposed. We're gonna pour oil on those, a little bit of salt and throw it in the oven. If you are trying to bulk because you have a cool muscle building thing coming up, go ahead and throw a ton of oil on there. Go for it, they're not gonna suffer. If you are on the other side of the world, you don't need to add any oil. You can just roast them with a little bit of salt and herbs too. Totally, the whole spectrum of eating is, is welcome here. But the big key is fresh fish, greens, potatoes, and something kind of vinegary. All right. And then here we go. So here, you know, we took those three little steps together. We cooked our potatoes, we braised our greens, we made our, our blackberry mustarda, and we put our salmon on the board. If you're gonna go to the grocery store, you can totally just buy a piece of salmon. I like skin on, it insulates it against the cooking, but you can just buy whatever kind of size piece of salmon you want. If you have cedar available to you, untreated, super important, do not just go buy a cedar shingle at Home Depot, make sure it is untreated cedar. Um, you can throw it on there. They also sell cedar sheets on the internet that you can order to put on there. Or you can just do it on like a cookie rack on a, on a sheet tray in the oven. You just want something that's going to let the fat and the water drain out of the salmon as it cooks. Cedar being wood is porous, so that fat kind of bubbles down. The bottom of the salmon is going to render nicely. The skin is not going to be super crispy. If you love crispy skin, get a pan out. That's a different webinar. This one is on cedar. It's great and it's easy too for a whole, whole family. You can buy one of those, those frozen cedar sides at, you know, at PCC or at your local fishmonger. You can drop it right on that cedar plank frozen, let it thaw out, salt and lemon. Um, and then here at the end, we've got, I just kind of broke it up. I used a spoon to serve this. There was no fancy tools involved. You know, we don't have any kind of fish spatulas out here. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Hama, but we are, we are picnic tables on the beach. We are pretty, pretty authentic experience when it comes to food. And we try to do that with our cooking as well. You know, so all of this was out of the garden, foraged or fish from a friend. Um, again, if you're not clear on, on where to buy good fish, I'd, I'd start with PCC and I'd walk right up to that fish counter and I'd say, hey friend, what do you got? What's fresh? Talk to me. Because these, these guys are experts in their field. You know, these people know what they're doing the same way I know how to cook a potato pretty well. So, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be the, the end all be all when you're buying fish of, of sustainable understanding. You just need to know where to go. And for me, for 20 years, that's been my fishmongers. Those people have taken good care of me. So uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's kind of our dish. And then at the end, I just threw some fresh lemon on top. As, this, as soon as the salmon came out of the oven, I threw a couple lemon rinds on there and just let the, the warm fish and the lemon juice kind of mix together. We threw the blackberry mustard on top. You are more than welcome to just leave it on the side too if people in your life aren't, aren't into fruit on their fish. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that was our dish. It took about 20 minutes start to finish once I had the mustard cooked. So, you know, don't feel like this is out, out of the realm of home cooking midweek. Piece of fish, some potatoes. You got this. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was awesome. I hope folks try this at home. Uh, I, I'm going to try it. Um, and, uh, and if you have questions for Sarah, uh, make sure you go down to the bottom of the page and go into the Q&A uh, question box and, and put your question in there and be sure to upvote other people's questions as well. So uh, thank you. And then let's have the next slide. 
So uh, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about salmon and sustainability. And I'm going to do an introduction for the topic before I hand it over to Amy. And she's going to talk about PCC's work on uh, salmon and seafood sustainability and their commitment to that. Uh, but just, just a little background along with the Kings. And then, and then I'm going to focus on um, the work that we've done on <clears throat> in support of killer whale recovery in the region. And that was a driver for PCC's work and then how we started to connect with them. So um, most of you probably know the mission of Long of the Kings is to recover wild salmon and steelhead and support sustainable fishing in the Northwest. And uh, my staff gives me a hard time, but I like to talk about killer whale uh, consumption and even uh, other mammals and other species consumption of fish as fishing. But um, you know, clearly we, we're talking about human uh, interaction with the fish, uh, cultural, recreational, commercial, and then of course for consumers. Um, and our vision of how to execute on our mission is that we're a rapidly growing region, uh, increasing human population. We have a very strong economy. How do we have those things in balance with a strong and flourishing salmon population? So that's, that's where, where we're trying to work. And those of you who support us, uh, we hope that's your uh, goal as well. Next slide, please. So um, what, one of the things that we're, we're pretty clear on in the region in the last few years is the trouble that our southern resident killer whale populations are in right now. Um, uh, the population was at a peak at one time about in the mid 90s or late 90s of 95 to 98 individuals and it dropped down to as low as 72 and with um, combined births and deaths I think we're up to about 74 now but it, this is considered a very low population and our resident uh, orca are listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And uh, these orcas eat about 98% salmon and they range from uh, the ocean off of the San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento River all the way up to Northern Vancouver Island. And they tend to target salmon uh, in that entire range. They will eat other things, uh, marine fish, uh, but they really drill down on salmon. And in the salmon population, they're very focused on Chinook. And uh, about 80% of that 98% of their diet is Chinook. And that's mostly because Chinook are real big. big it's the biggest salmon. They have a high fat content. So if the killer whale is going to go hunt for fish, they might as well go after the most nutritious package. But unfortunately, our Chinook salmon in Puget Sound and in, the, in many runs in the Columbia River and some of the runs up in the um, Fraser River and down in the Sacramento River and the Klamath River are all in trouble. Uh, in the US, many of them are listed as uh, threatened or endangered in the Endangered Species Act. So now we have one endangered species chasing another. Uh, hatchery production is one of the things that tends to support that, um, those populations, uh, but our hatchery populations are having a difficult time as well. So can I have the next slide, please? So uh, there are a number of factors that are, well, three principal factors that are contributing to the decline of killer whales as we understand it. One is uh, noise that may be disturbing their ability to feed from marine traffic. The second is contaminants either in their food or in the water that are damaging their fitness. And when they go into a starvation period, it releases those contaminants and, and that can make them sick. Uh, but the most uh, important factor seems to be not enough fish and not enough Chinook. So let's talk about some of the factors that could be causing that. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, there are three principal uh, things that contribute to declines in salmon. One is uh, harvest or uh, poorly managed harvest. The second is um, loss of habitat, physical habitat. Uh, the third is uh, interactions with um, hatchery populations. Even though hatchery populations can supplement the amount of salmon that's available to killer whales, it can also if not done properly or not managed properly, potentially harm the overall number of fish in the ocean. And a new factor that's becoming more and more apparent is uh, climate change. And what are the impacts of climate change on those salmon populations, both in the freshwater environment and also in the marine environment? One factor that's come to light in our discussions around uh, nutrition for killer whales is that our salmon are a lot smaller than they used to be. The average size of a Chinook salmon over the last 40 years has dropped by half. So let's say you're a Southern resident killer whale, you're swimming in the ocean looking for a fish. Now you have to put just as much effort in chasing a salmon that's um, 15 pounds instead of 30 pounds or 20 pounds instead of 40 pounds. 
And you can imagine how that could lead to nutritional stress. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing that's happened is that the diversity of our salmon populations returning to Puget Sound, at least, has shrunk. As recently as 1975, about half of the Chinook returning to Puget Sound came back uh, before August. And uh, recently now in 2010, that number has shrunk to about 12%. So if you're a, an angler um, or, or a commercial fisherman, you can adjust your season to go after those salmon when they're available. You can go harvest them in the fall. If you're a Southern resident killer whale and you come into the Salish Sea, Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia, uh, and the salmon uh, just aren't there and you're expecting you know, 50% of the salmon to return to be there in June, or July and you don't see them, that, that's a real problem. You can't just go to McDonald's and get a burger instead. So this is an issue that we think is increasingly important and something we need to pay attention to. It's both a hatchery population problem and a wild population problem. Next slide, please. Salmon used to be a lot more plentiful. Um, as recently as 1984, uh, in the US and Canada, about a million Chinook were landed uh, through the recreational and commercial fishery combined. Um, as in sh as short amount of ta time as about the mid 1990s, about 10 years, that number dropped by uh, 75 or 80 percent. And so these days of plentiful salmon that we see here from 1910, this is an image from the Museum of History and Industry, are uh, just no longer there. And our hatcheries are not adequately uh, making up for these populations. Next slide, please. So there, as I said before, there's some a number of factors of what could be affecting uh, salmon populations, freshwater habitat. But one of the things that we've noticed is a, a significant drop in the marine survival of juvenile salmon and steelhead that enter this, what we call the Salish Sea, Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia. And what you can see here is in the um, marine survival is the percent of juveniles that go out that return as adults. And we used to have very high survival for coho, chinook, and steelhead in Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia. And around the mid-1980s mid to the early 1990s, uh, that survival dropped considerably. And we don't see a similar trend in coastal rivers like the Columbia or rivers that feed directly into the ocean from the west coast of Washington State or British Columbia. So something funny is going on, but it certainly is affecting our fish. And, uh, in order to address this, next slide, please. Long of the Kings put together something called, called the Sailor Sea Marine Survival Project, principally run by us in the US and the uh, Pacific Salmon Foundation in Canada. And this was focused on trying to understand what are the problems. And we came up with a number of different solutions, looked at things like uh, increasing numbers of predators that were competing with orcas uh, and removing juvenile salmon. Uh, like harbor seals, uh, changes in the food web that salmon depend on, things like forage fish and zooplankton were not as abundant or not as abundant at the same time. Uh, things like contaminants in lower rivers uh, and diseases in some cases were impacting salmon. So as a result of that, next slide please, um, Long Live the Kings was uh, the uh, one salmon nonprofit organization that was invited to participate in Governor Inslee's Southern Resident Orca Task Force. And uh, about 20% of the recommendations that were ultimately put forward to the legislature and the governor to be funded came directly out of that marine survival research. So that's what we're focused on and will be focused on over the next five years. And if you read our strategic roadmap, it's available on our website. You can hear about some of the projects that we have going on. But um, while we were involved working with the governor's task force, we were approached by PCC and they asked us to help them think about how to sustainably source Chinook for their, um, uh, to offer to their uh, customers as, and their cons consumers. And so we were really excited to, to work with them. Um, and they were looking at principally, how does harvest impact potential salmon populations that could be supporting Southern resident killer whales? And what are some considerations that they can take into account? So um, with that buildup, I'll turn it over to Amy and, oh, I'm sorry, one more slide. So um, uh, there is another impact that I didn't mention um, and that and that so there have been some management actions to address harvest. So one of those is uh, the Pacific Salmon uh, Commission, which manages the treaty between Alaska and the rest of American states 
and Canada uh, just renegotiated the treaty in the last year, and they came forward with a reduction in the allocation of Chinook from the lower 48 um, to Alaska and to BC, which hopefully will uh, allow more Chinook to escape and be available for southern resident killer whales to, to eat. So there have been some management changes, but Amy's going to talk about some efforts that they've been putting into uh, for sustainability relative to sourcing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you. Have to go off mute the eternal uh, plight of all of us on uh, virtual <laughs> interaction. Hello, thanks, Jock. That was great. Um, such fascinating information, and so much of that builds into kind of what, as he noted, we will be talking about about why we kind of decided to develop our own Chinook sourcing standard. But before I dive into that, um, you can go on to the next slide, please. I think you know it's important. I think a lot of people know that you know PCC. Um, you know, we are a triple bottom line co-op and we, that means we consider social and environmental impacts in everything that we do. And, you know, setting strong internal sustainability standards is just one piece of that. Um, but we also kind of prioritize uh, certifications. We partner with uh, sustainability leaders like Long Live the Kings. Um, we advocate and we educate on the issues, uh, just like what Jacques was talking about. Um, and we do that, you know, through a lot of different means, but that is because we know we have to kind of take a comprehensive approach to really addressing the issues that our members and our shoppers and our, you know, region cares about. Next slide, please. So when it comes to seafood standards, um, you know, we have kind of multiple layers on when it comes to our seafood, you know, overarchingly, um, we utilize um, and we are partners with Monterey Bay Seafood Watch um, and we, you know, use their kind of green and yellow ratings as our guide uh, for all of our fresh and frozen seafood. Um, but, you know, we know that there are limitations um, when it comes to kind of the larger certifications. Um, so we always like to kind of dig down and say, hey, what more can we do to kind of push the ball forward on things that we know that matter to our shoppers or that are, you know, a health or sustainability issue. So other, you know, standards that we have for, you know, across the board are, you know, we don't sell seafood known to be high in mercury or other contaminants. Um, for farm seafood, we have a very highly curated selection. We do not allow any net pen um, farm raised uh, salmon or any kind of carnivorous fish. Um, and we also have even gone the step of, you know, majority of our fish uh, is sourced from the United States and USA because, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of exploitation issues that have kind of arisen um, from other sourcing and more international sourcing. So we've really kind of targeted that. But then, you know, we like to even go a little bit further than that. And as um, Jacques just described, you know, for a long time, our region and our shoppers and our members, because they are very passionate about what, you know, environmental issues and ecosystem issues that are going on, have cared about uh, what's happening with the southern resident um, orcas and with the Chinook stocks. And, um, but that all very much came to the surface for all of us in 2018, uh, when Tahlequah, uh, one of the members of the J-Pod, um, conducted her 17-day vigil um, with her deceased calf. Um, and, you know, it really, I think, pulled at everyone's heartstrings, not only in the region, but, you know, across the world, there were reports about this because um, it was very uncommon. And we started really hearing from our members saying, hey, you know, what can you do about this? <laughs> Um, and because, you know, we like a challenge, um, we kind of started looking around and said, okay, what can we do about this? You know, there is a clearly a connection between Chinook and Southern residents and that's, you know, on our shelves. So, you know, what is a step we could take? Um, none of the, you know, Seafood Watch or MSC certifications dug down on that level or addressed the Southern residents. Um, and so at the time we kind of said, okay, I think what we want to do is say we're just not going to sell Chinook from the Northwest region. And so uh, next slide, please. We, at that time, we absolutely the right decision. Um, we, you know, established a, a Pacific Northwest Chinook moratorium, which meant that we wouldn't sell um, Chinook salmon from Washington, Oregon, or British Columbia. And, you know, it was, showed our commitment. It was the right decision. But we also, as Jacques kind of noted, started kind of hearing from um, marine conservation experts and tribal leaders and fishermen. And I mean, a lot of different people who had a lot more expertise in this than even us. And we're saying, look, this is a wonderful step and idea. It may not be the 
accomplishing what you're really going for here. Next slide, please. And some of the key kind of things that we heard, and these kind of rose to the top of why that moratorium was maybe not accomplishing our goal was one, because we still were sourcing from Alaska and Southeast Alaska. Um, and Jacques kind of hinted at this in his last slide um, with the, the recent kind of decision. It is actually the place where a lot of the fish from all of our region go to kind of feed and live out their lives. And yet that was being fished. So we were actually probably still selling a lot of the fish that we were seeking to avoid. Um, and those were still kind of fish that were going to be going through the feeding pathways and territory of the Southern residents. And then the second um, kind of piece of information that kept rising to the top of why it maybe wasn't achieving what we wanted it to was that by excluding the sourcing from the Pacific Northwest. We were also excluding local tribes and fishermen um, and sourcing opportunities of people that had really cared about this issue and had been really working hard to establish some, as Jacques pointed out, what, you know, management techniques and standards that were would help to support, you know, these these industries, but also these cultures and and also the Chinook and Southern residents. And so we were excluding them from not only our conversations and ability to way of think about how we do this better, but also from our stores and being able to support the work that they were doing. Um, so we realized, okay, we had a lot more work to do, but we were going to need some help um, because this was increasingly becoming a very complicated topic, as Jacques can speak to. Um, and so we did enlist um, the support of the National Fisheries Conservation Center to kind of be our expert support in developing our own standard. And over the course of two years, um, and we met with Long Live the Kings, we met with various stakeholders to review uh, the research and the standard um, on this work and to say, hey, is this, you know, heading in the right direction? Um, there is no universal solution yet, um, but it was really fascinating work and we did develop a standard and then it, we're able to evaluate certain um, fisheries, uh, kind of a first set of those fisheries to see if they would meet those standards. Next slide, please. And so the just top line of our standard, and this is all posted in detail on 60 pages worth um, on our website. So I encourage you, if this is something you enjoy, please go review it. Um, but the top kind of key things that our standard tries to achieve for Chinook salmon um, is, you know, we evaluate the prey interception risk. So does the fishery that we're sourcing from intercept Southern residents main Seuss? A food source. Have they already had a chance to get that salmon? That's basically what we're trying to say. Has it already passed through their feeding grounds? Then the next level is stock risk. Now we recognize we're, we're going to be selling Chinook salmon. So any salmon, yes, it has been taken from that pool. But we looked down at the data of the fisheries that we looked at and we compared it against our kind of standards that were developed in the standard with everyone's input to say, is this minimizing negative impacts on that Chinook stock? Um, is it having a chance to build and continue to thrive and produce enough salmon? So then the last piece is, you know, a lot of this, the biggest challenge we found was that there wasn't a lot of information on it. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we built that into the standard as well. And um, so we have a knowledge risk component, which do errors or uncertainties in the data and evidence increase risks to whales or the fish? So basically, is there enough information for us even to make the evaluations um, for the prey risk and the stock risk. Next slide, please. And then what we do is we run, we take a fishery and we look, you know, our experts look at all of the data and information and management standards and everything that's in, you know, any policies they can analyze. And then they run it against that standard that we've developed and they give it a rating of an A, B or C. And it's the usual A is the best, C is less, less good. Um, for prey interception, we require an A. Um, for the stock risk, we allow for an AB. Um, and if a fishery receives those ratings, then we can source from that. So it's kind of, what we have to do is we do have to do the work of evaluating each fishery, which is a pretty, um, well, and our, our, our partners at NFCC have been charged with that wonderful task. Um, and we do post those on our website, the evaluations that are up there for the fisheries. So right now we have four fisheries that have been approved. All right, next slide, please. And so this kind of just gives you a look at when it came out in the stores, this is how we you know, described it. Um, next slide. 
And then right, you know, now when you go into the stores, these are kind of the, this is the information that you would see on um, the Chinook salmon versus our just general seafood um, kind of information. And I should emphasize that this was just for Chinook. We have not done this for coho or sockeye right now. That is still under our kind of uh, Monterey Bay seafood watch general seafood standards, um, you know, but there's there's a lot of hope that like, hey, is this something that, you know, we can continue to develop and, and bring forward depending on on its how it works for the Chinook level. All right, next slide, please. So I, you know, I think this was such an experience. We're very excited about this. We know there's a lot more work to do, though. We did not kind of issue the standard as like a guarantee that, yes, this is perfect. This is, you know, what we learned mostly was that Unfortunately, sourcing, um, when it comes to especially the Southern resident and Chinook sourcing um, or Chinook kind of plight that they're facing, and Jacques definitely emphasized this, uh, you know, the issues that are really, really rising to the top on what's causing the decline are, you know, habitat um, destruction and climate change. And so we recognize that as a retailer, you know, I think our, for the next phase of this work, you know, is what more can we do beyond our shelves and sourcing? Um, we're going to continue doing our evaluations and applying and improving the standard. Um, and yet going forward, we also realized, hey, as a retailer, we need to both continue doing kind of some of the things that are listed here, um, you know, like our partnership with Chinook Wines and Long Live the Kings, um, you know, making sure that we partner with Salmon Safe Certified Farms, um, donating to Center for Whale Research through purchases of our, our cards by Lottie. They're really beautiful cards. I recommend them. <laughs> and, you know, but also just really continue to support all the great work that this entire kind of community, um, like Long Live Kings and all of us have, have kind of dedicated to ourselves to. And then really seeing what are the next level and things that we can do as a retailer to, to drive forward on these other issues. Um, and so I think it is important, yes, try to, to I prioritize that sourcing, but also like, hey, what more can we weigh in on um, moving forward to really see some changes in the trajectories that you know Jacques highlighted in some of those graphs. But so that was a, kind of our exciting work that we did on the Chinook sourcing. Um, it was definitely an experience and we're really looking forward to kind of continuing that work. Um, and as I said, next slide, please. The, this is all available online because transparency is really, really key to us. Um, we know that this was a lot of hard work. There is no one answer. Um, so we think sharing this information, hearing feedback, making sure that we're all just kind of driving forward on this and then giving you access to know what it means when we really say, hey, we developed the standard. We're not just saying that. Here, you can go look at it um, and really dig into that. You know, all of it is available on our website. Um, you can also read about kind of the story in our Sound Consumer um, newspaper. And that is the story behind the sourcing standard right now. <laughs> Very nice. So uh, I think we have a uh, slide uh, that shows our sponsor, some information about our sponsors. Um, so we're going to have the, we're going to go into the question and answer, but first I, I, uh, I think we had a slide, uh, with our sponsors on it. Is that the very, yeah. Um, so, um, th that's what we had in terms of the, the presentations. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, uh, is, is there anything that you guys want to say, maybe, uh, Sarah, first for everybody while they're on the call before we go into the question and answer about about um, Hamma Hamma or what, what you guys are doing or any follow up comment you want to make before we launch into the question and answer. Um, totally. Yeah, our, our farm's located out in Lillawap on the west side of the Hood Canal. We're about two, two and a half hours from Seattle, depending on traffic. But, um, you know, if you're interested, we do ship oysters out, oysters, clams, hunters, all that kind of stuff out. We do FedEx shipping. So one to two day, depending on the time of year. But you can get oysters delivered to your house in Fremont or South Seattle or Bellingham or wherever you might be. Um, we're offering free shipping to everybody right now in Washington state and oysters are a classic for New Year's. I'd highly recommend uh, getting a couple. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot. So uh, Amy, anything you wanna let folks know about what's going on at PCC right now before we launch into the questions? Oh, yeah, it's just, it's an exciting time. Obviously it's the holidays and we have a lot of great kind of, <laughs> 
you know, seafood specials as well as a lot of other wonderful foods on our shelves. Um, you know, we have 15 stores now, um, over 90,000 active members. We're the largest food co-op in the country. And, you know, as you can see, we really are passionate about what we provide and want to change the food system. So come support us and, you know, all of the wonderful vendors and producers that we, we bring into our stores. Great. I, I will, uh, I'll make a plug right now the, that there is a um, Chinook, uh, a special Chinook Long of the Kings blend, both a white and a red that you can pick up uh, with your holiday shopping at PCC markets and $2 <laughs> a bottle goes to support Long of the Kings work to recover salmon and steelhead. So if you're in the store and you need some wine, got both colors uh, and it's, and it's awesome. It's really so, good. <laughs> Without, uh, without uh, further ado, let's get to the question. So we have the first question here is for Amy. Um, Amy, uh, where can people read their Chinook your Chinook sourcing guidelines and learn more about PCC and Southern, um, I guess it's Southern resident killer whales. Okay. Um, well, it, I, the, the answer is the same either way. Um, you can go to our website, which is pccmarkets.com, and there is a sustainability uh, tab. And in that tab, there is an honest products um, kind of area and click on that, uh, scroll down and you've got this whole seafood section and that has its own Chinook section. And in that section, we have links to all of the documents. So our standard, the supporting guidelines and the evaluations for uh, the fisheries that have been approved thus far. And all of it's about 60 pages total. Um, and it's really detailed and complex as to what does the standard mean? What went into the research there? And um, we'll also probably be updating it soon with a couple of other um, FAQ. There's an FAQ. So we can answer a lot of questions there. You can click on that. Um, we really, like I said, wanted to make sure that people had access to the information. So there's more than enough to read um, about that. And then, of course, if you have follow-up questions, please always feel free to reach out to um, you know the social environmental responsibility team um, and or through the customer service uh, representative, which is also on the website, and they'll always forward those questions to us. Great. I think that this must be a question from either my marketing team or from uh, one of my board members. This is for Amy, it says, how has, you, how has your relationship with Long Live the Kings helped your marketing? How do you feel we can grow this relationship? Um, you know, I mean, I think it goes without saying that, you know, Long Live the Kings is such a respected organization. And um, so I think it goes both ways in that they've also really helped us um, in, you know, the, in the work that we're doing to try and make sure that we're building these standards, um, just providing that information and support and being a partner in kind of diving into these issues, doing the scientific work that you're doing and evaluate, you know, having that um, is just, I mean, we keep with our sound consumer, we keep, you know, promoting that work, we keep relying on it in the work that we're doing for our standards. Um, so, you know, I think that just kind of really putting our heads together and then also think, talking about that next phase too, that I was um, kind of speaking to on the Chinook work of, we've got to think beyond the shelves. So, you know, how can retailers and other organizations um, have more impact? Can we all come together in a more unified way to maybe really start addressing some of those other issues? I think that's the, the kind of goals there. And then of course the partnerships that we have with like Jacques mentioned, like the Chinook wines and everything. I mean, that's a benefit for us because it really get, shows our shoppers that we care and we know it benefits you. So finding other opportunities like that too. Great, thanks. So, so I have a question for uh, Sarah. So, Sarah, can you say a little bit about um, how uh, how you go about sustainably raising and harvesting uh, oysters in Hood Canal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, aquaculture is a fantastic sustainable uh, exercise in fishing. In that we don't add any water, we don't add any feed, and we don't use any chemicals at all in the cultivation of our shell stock. Um, so we are benefiting the environment. Oysters filter about 55 gallons of water per day per oyster. So in addition to being a, a farmed protein that we are not adding a bunch of stuff to, they also are benefiting our ecosystem here um, and creating a better environment for the other, the other sea creatures that kind of help benefit them as well. So, you know, the better the water quality, the better the oysters, but also the better the eelgrass, the better the salmon spawn, the better the otters, the better the tideland. Um, you know, it's, it's very much in the interests of good oyster farming to be loud and, and vocal advocates of clean water protections, of, you know, river protections, estuaries, um, 
you know, we, the Hama Hama company has been here for almost hundred years. 2022 will be our hundred year anniversary. And we started as a timber farm. And since we manage the majority of the, the river that feeds into our own estuary, that is, it's a huge benefit towards sustainable sustainable aquaculture. We know that there's no weird chemicals going in. We know that there's no unmanaged septic systems. Um, and we work with the community as well to make sure that that is happening around us because it benefits us, but it benefits the human beings that live in our community, which is really kind of the point of farming is to, to sustain each other. So, you know, we, we use sustainable farming practices, but we also advocate for sustainable living in our environment to help support that. Great, Thank, thanks so much. Um, I love coming out to visit your site. So um, I had a, there's a question for me here. It's, it's uh, what is the difference uh, between using the term killer whale and orca to describe our orcas or our Southern resident killer whales? And um, that, it's an interesting one. When the governor first started the uh, Southern resident killer whale task force, that was the name of it. And the acronym was SRKW. Uh, and the scientists, uh, particularly at NOAA who work on uh, orcas prefer to use killer whale, which is the common term. I think from a, um, a public perspective, it's kind of a scary word. Uh, and, it, and I think there is some concern that that might um, cast a negative shadow on the species. And some people may be concerned, oh, they're dangerous and we, why would we want to protect those? So uh, <laughs> over the period of the work of the task force, the name shifted from the Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force to the Southern Resident Orca Task Force. And now we see orca just in the last few years much more commonly used to describe the, the animal. I think it is more to do almost with marketing than with a, a technical term or not. This orca is the genus and the species name. Uh, so here's a question for Amy. Uh, are there sustainable salmon options for low income individuals? That is a really good question. Um, I mean, I have, you know, to be honest, I have to say like salmon in general is not an inexpensive um, fish, especially um, the Chinook salmon. Um, so as far as, you know, with us, you know, there we're pretty hemmed in, especially with this kind of specific sourcing um, on the price points there. But, you know, that's a great question. And I would love to, you know, kind of Jack, I think that's something that we could all work on and seeing like, are there sources, are there suppliers that that have kind of that, you know, angle and option to offer kind of a better price point on that. So um, the cheapest way to get salmon is in the Pacific, in the Puget Sound region is to go to the hardware store and buy a fishing rod and reel for like <laughs> 35 or 50 bucks and get a, a salmon license and go to the shoreline every other year and try to catch pink salmon because they are plentiful. They are not listed or endangered in any way that we know of. Uh, and they are easy to catch from the beach. You don't need a boat. You don't need uh, a downrigger. You don't need a fish finder. You just go go to a shoreline where you know those fish will be coming along, uh, and you can catch them. And even in places like the Duwamish uh, or in Elliott Bay, where the water quality or the sediment quality is not that terrific, these fish are coming from the ocean, so they don't have contaminants in them like a flounder or some other resident fish would have. So you can pretty be pretty assured that they'll be safe. You're not gonna. They don't weigh uh, 30 or 40 pounds. Uh, they're more like five or eight pounds, but um, I, it's my favorite way to fish for them because it's easy and quick and I catch them. Uh, it's kind of fish well, for this, family too. You know, the, the, the giant salmon, it's a lot of fish to process. So the little guys are perfect for dinner. Yeah, eat them. Don't, if, it's, if you're catching pink, eat them right away. So here's a question for Sarah. Um, best salmon for grab, grab locks? Um, I, really, I love, um, I love sockeye for this. If you can get little tiny, you know, seven pound or under Chinook, that's wonderful too. That's kind of a specialty item, at least in my purchasing world. But sockeye is readily available. Um, we sell it at our farm store here, you know, sustainably caught from a, a Alaskan source. I know PCC has beautiful, beautiful sockeye fillets. Um, they work well size wise. It's, it's kind of hard to create grab locks, especially at home when you're working with a, an 18 inch fillet. So the sockeye are a little bit easier to use. And the the evenness of the fillet size is going to be critical when you make grab locks. You don't want something that's got a huge hump on the fillet end. Um, the fact that the belly and the fillet body are about the same means that it's going to cure in the same amount of time. 
Great. Thanks for that. Here's another question for you, Sarah. And then I think maybe um, this is the last or the second to the last questions because we don't want to keep folks too late. Um, we said we release you at, at um, 6.30. I also, before uh, we ask this last question, I just want to make sure everybody knows we've had some requests to um, watch this uh, recorded. And this is being recorded and it'll be available on our website later. So if you want to watch this, I hope that's okay with Sarah and Amy. I hope we asked you that. Uh, you guys are doing a great job, so you're not going to embarrass yourselves. Um, and uh, and uh, we're very excited to offer this. So if you didn't get to see the whole thing, you came in late or you want to share it with a friend, this will be on our website. Stay tuned. We'll let you know. Uh, so Sarah, quick question. Uh, how is climate change impacting oyster farming? Uh, question mark. Increased acidity impacts? Question mark. Non-native invasive species? Question mark. Uh-oh, did we lose Sarah? Well, we won't ask her that question. Um, <laughs> well, I guess uh, we're, we're also like one minute away from, oh, there's Sarah, you're back. Sarah, can you hear me? I can, sorry, my uh, computer died, so we're on a phone now. <laughs> oh, okay. Am I well, here? So the question for you was um, climate change impacts on oyster farming. Totally. This is a big conversation that we're having right now. Um, my, my boss, Lissa, just I recently spoke um, at a couple conferences about this. We are working uh, with our oyster, our oyster community, as well as with kind of the greater legislative group to address how we are going to continue to farm oysters. They are a very, uh, they, they do kind of bounce back pretty well. They've got a, a spectrum of growth that that we are still within, but the concern is that as the water temperatures continue to rise and acidification becomes a bigger issue, um, that oysters are going to suffer. And they're kind of the tip of the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the entire ecosystem that we're working with. So we are, you know, very, very carefully following natural spawn sets here at the farm. In good news, we had an amazing natural spawn this year. We had one of the best we've had in 20 years. So that's a huge, huge, great sign. Um, but yeah, the oyster farming community is definitely aware and very concerned with climate change. We are advocating hard for better climate, better shoreline protections and water regulations um, because you know it benefits us all. If the salmon aren't healthy, the oysters aren't healthy, the the tides aren't healthy. You know, it's it's one big ecosystem. <laughs> Great, thanks so much. So I guess we're at the, the end of our time. So I'm going to let um, uh, first Sarah say any last comments you want for our audience. Um, anything you want to say before we sign off? Um, thank you so much for all being here. And I really hope nobody is scared of cooking. You, you have the power to do this. Great. Uh, Amy, last comments from you before we sign off. Yeah, I just want to echo, thank you everyone for being on this, for listening, for being interested in the work that all of us are doing um, to, I think, kind of really move forward with sustainable seafood and, and how we kind of change these, these impacts. So I appreciate you listening. Great. And I'll just, uh, on behalf of Long of the Kings, thank you to Sarah and Amy for participating in tonight's webinar. Really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate everything you guys are doing to contribute to sustainability and make sure that people have safe and healthy seafood here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, on behalf of Long of the Kings, thank you everybody who joined us tonight and have a safe and happy holiday. We'll see you.